The following is part of a seven episode mini series featuring a select group of 500 startup portfolio companies that participated in the Alibaba eFounders initiative. The entrepreneurs who were all from Southeast Asia visited the Alibaba Business School campus in Hangzhou for 11 days earlier this year and were coached directly by Jack Ma and his team. Welcome to The Jay Kim Show, Hong Kong's first dedicated podcast on investing in Asia. Join us as we survey the land and discover the greatest companies and most profitable investment opportunities in Asia. If this is your first time listening, thank you for stopping by. This podcast is produced every week with the goal of providing actionable insights to you, the listener, with every single episode. And now, on to the show. This week's show guest is Mark Ko, who's the co-founder and CEO of Superhands. Superhands is a service that helps companies across the globe scale and cr- increase productivity through the outsourcing of tedious and repetitive business processes. They do this by prov- providing clients with a large talent pool of super agents that span across Southeast Asia to assist with tasks such as database management, content moderation, and image annotation. Mark, welcome to the show, man. Hi, Jay. Thanks for having me. Yeah, cool. So um, why don't you give our audience a little bit of background of yourself, uh, you know, where you came from, uh, what you studied in school or, 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 or didn't study, and uh, if you had any jobs prior to becoming an entrepreneur. Yeah, so um, I guess my background, I, I'm Malaysian, born in Malaysia, grew up in Australia, did school over there, worked in banking, so not the most interesting um, job <laughs> in my early years, but, you know, I guess it sort of gave me a bit of corporate experience. Um, sure. From then on, decided to move back to Southeast Asia. Decided uh, because I guess it's uh, it was it was becoming a pretty interesting space. Um, I think things were starting to boom. Um, the market starting to heat up. Tech started becoming a bit more interesting in Southeast Asia. So I thought, hey, let's move back um, to the region and uh, let's see what we could build. So you know, when I first moved back, you know, I set up a an e-commerce business, um, streetwear company, doing you know retail clothing. And a whole bunch of other things. And after a few more years, we decided to set up a call center. And what we did... In this, is, the, this is in Malaysia? Yeah, in Malaysia. That's right. So it was okay. especially doing call center work for, for Australian companies. And you know, partway through that business, I realized there must be a better way to, to build um, an outsourcing company or build something that's a lot more scalable, that didn't have the, the I guess, capital intensity and the high attrition rate of, of, of humans sitting behind a, a desk. So we decided to crowdsource um, you know, a workforce, decided to find people who could work remotely to help us. And so we shut that business down and set up super hands. Um, so we've been around for about three and a half years now. Very interesting, uh, Mark. So, so okay, so you, you, now you have family in Malaysia, I gather? Yep, that's correct. Okay, so so you were, and then you were, you were doing banking and, and this sort of thing at, in Australia at the time. Yeah, that's right. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, no, I mean, look, I, I used to be a banker too, <laughs> and I think a lot of my, my audience and, and my subscribers they they uh, they're well familiar with with this sort of thing. But I always uh, I I actually I have a soft spot in for bankers that have come out uh, because uh, for the most part I'm I'm just jealous because uh, <laughs> it's actually difficult to come out of the banking system yeah. and just kind of do a startup. And so when I meet Ex bankers that are doing interesting startups. Um, I, I actually, I actually really enjoy uh, hearing how they, what their process is, and you know, because I think that maybe it's not just banking, but every sort of uh, industry when you're working for someone else, and if you're sort of more entrepreneurial, you kind of, you're always thinking, okay, how am I going to get out, or maybe I should try this and that on the side, and then, and then when you finally do get out and are starting to see some traction, then it's always, uh, it's always heartwarming for me to hear. So, um, okay, so it's interesting when you said that you originally started with call centers because um you know i know a couple of my friends are do that sort of thing in the philippines and yep. from what i gather it's actually quite a fairly lucrative business no yeah it is it is a good business you know i think it's definitely um in the philippines even in malaysia it's it's pretty it's it's quite a big business um but i think i, I that i wanted a more technology driven business um mm. something that wasn't as traditional as outsourcing and we decided to move the business into something that was a bit more interesting, a bit more different. Right. Okay. So how did you uh, 
if you basically were think, thinking, okay, I want to take this, uh, whether it's call center or maybe expand the, the suite of offerings and actually make it uh, into a technology-based solution, what was your sort of first step? I mean, did you have to, are you, a, do you have any tech background yourself or did you have to hire or find a co-founder or that sort of thing? Yeah, no tech background. Um, we had, so essentially it's putting a bunch of friends together that, you know, guys in tech, guys in, um, I guess, consulting. And, you know, we built the team, um, launched the first product and, and I guess, yeah, here we are. <laughs> Was it clear how you were going, you know, I mean, was it, was the initial, the first offering was basically let's, re, let's replace the call center with. Never, uh, actually, that, that was never the, the intention okay. because call center businesses, I feel, you know, will, will remain for well, the next couple of years. Um, but what we wanted to do was to move away from calls and focus on data. So anything to do with data that can be worked on virtually. So we wanted to empower people who could work from home, um, working on little pieces of data um, for companies across the world. Okay, I see. Interesting. Okay, so uh, why don't you give us uh, sort of the one-on-one? I mean, I, I, I know I gave a, a very, very uh, broad strokes overview uh, before we started talking, but for, you know, for, let's, let's dive in a little deeper. So, so tell us exactly what the offerings are uh, that, that you guys have. Um, and how potentially a client can can uh, use your services. So maybe you could walk us through sort of the user experience as well. Yeah, sure. So I guess today, um, you know, the business is at a point where we help companies digitize. We help companies um, clean lots and lots of data points. We help companies train data for machine learning um, applications. We help companies tag, annotate, label lots and lots of data points. Um, and it ranges from images to audio to video. So, and what we do is with our platform and our technology, we're able to break these large projects down into very small micro tasks and feed them across um, our workforce or across our, our, our platform to different people to work on. I see. Okay. So is there, uh, is there a good example of, uh, of an ideal sort of client of, of, uh, of your company? Let's say, I mean, is, I know you, you work from everything from SMEs to large multinationals. So what, what, is, your, what is your most popular type of client that, that comes to you for help? Essentially, you know, um, a digital company that, um, that might have um, lots of, say, products that need to be curated. So for when merchants upload products onto e-commerce platforms, um, it comes in, you know, they, they send through images, they send through different data points. So what we need to do is to basically ensure it's clean. Um, we need to make sure it's QC'd and qualified and verified um, using our tech and using our humans. Um, so that's a very typical example of the kind of work. Um, apart from that, we've got, um, say, machine learning companies. And I think that in, 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 at this current time, um, lots of companies are moving into the machine learning space. And they then realize that, hey, you need a lot of clean data. And it's not so easy to get data clean. Um, and we essentially act as the, the sanity check um, for a lot of these machines. Um, we, you know, we receive data from, from different companies. We help them to annotate it and clean it um, before it can be uploaded into their models itself. Okay. All right. Okay. So, so let's, uh, let's do, let's do like a really, really basic example. You mentioned, uh, say like an e-commerce type company. So let's say I am a, um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, would, would an example mark like, like just someone that's, let's say, yeah, say it's a, a large e-commerce company with lots and lots of merchants uploading products on a daily basis. Right. So like, uh, yeah, right. So any one of the, um, large retailers, let's say, or, or even medium sized that are, that have a bunch of different products uploading to their site that client or their customers then are coming to their site, you know, bunch of page views, trying to, trying to click and buy purchase products off their website. Right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So if this is a customer of yours, they come to you and they're like, okay, Mark, I need help with, uh, my data. Um, you know, what, what can you do for them? You know, you, you mentioned uh, the, the, the term clean data. What, what exactly does that mean? So what we do is we, we ensure that the, I guess the tags that they have on, um, on the products match the front end of, of their websites. Um, so for example, we, ma we match the color of, um, a t-shirt, for example, right. we, we match the, um, the occasion that they might be using that, that, that type of clothing for, um, it could be electronics, for example, where we might need to, to ensure that 
say the phone that they're uploading matches the description or the the features of that phone that's on their website itself. Uh-huh. So the, the yeah, so that's how we ensure it's it's clean data and clean um a clean product. I see. Okay, so um, let's just take a real quick example of uh, like a clothing company, say like something like uh, uh, I don't know Uniqlo, say for example, uh, or or something like that. So they have all these products. It would be it would be more of a marketplace, actually. Okay, marketplace. So something like a. Um, you could say an Amazon. Amazon, right, right. Okay, so in Amazon, they have just a, a bunch of different verticals, like every category you could imagine under the sun. Uh, and then within that, there's all these different products with all different colors and sizes and shapes. Uh, so there's basically just a boatload of data. And there's, there's a, uh, I guess if, if normally companies would want to do that, is it usually uh, as they scale, is it like just a workforce that basically uploads the photo and, and adds the description and tag? And then that's how the data set gets built initially? Yeah, so you know, I think it's a combination of, of, of tech and, and also workforce. You do, need, um, you do need localized knowledge, especially if, if the data is being uploaded from, say, um, Southeast Asia. Um, you do need the understanding of what different, you know, different things are used for. Okay, yeah, so let's say, um, let's, say, let's say the Amazon comes to you and they're like, okay, Mark, I need your help. Um, at what, you know, so at what point, I, I'm just curious as to, and, and I apologize because I'm not uh, that, um, I'm not that familiar with sort of uh, the, the data management side of, of these businesses, but I'm just curious as to what point do these companies have to, you know, what's the benefit of using uh, super hands versus basically them uh, beefing up their internal uh, department. Uh, you know, I mean, is it just a, it's a cost thing or is it, are, is there actual superiority in technology that you provide? Things that, yeah, the combination, um, one, yeah, one's definitely the, the technology, the speed that we're able to do things at the accuracy. Uh, I think that's a key thing that everyone focuses on. It's the accuracy of the, you know, of the, of the quality checks that we, that we go through. Um, the speed that we can get it done at and at the scale. So we're able to, to scale things up and down whenever the client needs to. So during um, occasions where like Christmas, for example, when there's a whole bunch of products that need to be uploaded really quickly, mm. um, we're able to scale up and scale down whenever they need to. So I think these are the, the three key things that these companies look for. Nice. And, and, yeah, and that's why they'd rather pass it on to us um, who, sort of, who are experts in this field than do it themselves internally and having to build um, their, own, um, their own workforce and build technology internally. Right. Okay. Got it. Understood. So I, I guess this would be, uh, okay, this is interesting. I guess at, at some point when the business starts scaling and it's basically a, it's a cost, cost thing where it's like, okay, I could just, ha- I could just hire super hands and they're probably going to do a much better job for a lot cheaper <laughs> than me trying to piece together in a house tech team to do this right yeah that's right okay cool and and so so how does your company's revenue model is it basically a contract uh type you know, they hire you for a certain period of time so it, yeah it's usually um it's usually for because a lot of the work is, is ongoing in nature mm-hmm. so you know you, you get data uploaded and passed on to us on a daily basis so yeah, we are on you know longer term contracts, um, but we like to offer the flexibility to to different clients depending on you know what they sort of need. So essentially, what we try to do is to help these companies um, accelerate um, you know their charge towards digitization, and we're able to then scale up and scale down whenever they need that to happen. Right. Okay. So, yeah, we do we do have contracts with each of these different clients. Right. Okay. Got it. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, the super agents now that work. Uh, I guess they work for your company, right? Um, they don't work for us directly, so they 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 work as um, I guess they you could call them agents on on our platform. Okay. So they come and go whenever they need to. We curate the workforce, so that that's another that's a key USP that we have compared to a lot of other guys in the space. Right. We ensure a curated workforce um, that comes through, and the localize the localization of this workforce um, within this region, this part of the world. I see. So, and this supplements your own companies. Uh, I mean, do you have your own agents, or you're actually literally just the tech in the middle, in the in the middleman? So we're just yeah, we're only the t- we're the tech in the middle. I got it. Okay. Okay. So we're, so we're an asset light business essentially. Got it. Understood. Now. Okay. Sorry, Mark. It's taken me a little while to actually understand your full your full business model. So basically, on the on the on the front end, you're you're providing this this service, but also on the the on the uh, agent side. 
um, you're basically providing uh, something like a uh, we're creating jobs, right? Like a Fiverr or one of these like type of uh, where where people can actually uh, be hired uh, to yep. for these tasks. That's correct. Got it. Got it. Okay. Now I now I fully understand. Okay. So <laughs> um, and then so how does the, the sort of the payment uh, work? I guess on the client side you have uh, that that you just talked about. How do the agents get paid then for their work? It's just on a contract basis. Is there any sort of bidding uh, process for them to earn jobs? It's essentially on the you know for each unit that they complete. So successful completion of work, um, then they do get paid for that. And that the platform's able to help us to um, decide what the amount and what what the payment terms are. Right. Okay. And how do you sort of uh, handle the quality control of the agents that are doing the work for you? So we built multiple models internally to help us do that. So I guess it's the the platform, the technology that we've got that helps us to um, you know create the efficiency to help us to curate and QC the kind of work. But I think the curated workforce that we also have how we, we put the agents through different tests do help us to ensure that we've got high quality guys um, who do the work. We've got routing technology that helps us to route the right job to the right person at the right time um, because we, we are able to, when we collect data on, on all the different agents that we've got, we know who's good at doing what particular type of work. We've got historical data on different agents so we know how accurate each person is and how, you know, how, how much quality each person is able to output. I see. Uh, what, what is the um, application process like for if you want to be an agent? Like how, how does that work? It's quite simple, actually. You just got to jump onto the platform, so superhands.com and you know, hit the super agent side of things. And you're able to um, go through a, a quick questionnaire. A um, couple of assessments, and yeah, you might get selected um, to to jump on. And then there are different hoops that you've got to pass through after that as well. But it's uh, it's fairly straightforward. Very interesting. Very interesting. So I, I'm I, I guess if you are um, if you're in that space, if you're if you're if you have a, a skill set, then you probably will have heard of uh, Superhands. Now, are there are there I imagine there's competitors in, in what you're doing because it sounds pretty sophisticated. I, I'm sure that uh, there's other people that have thought of it or maybe not. I mean, I don't know. Oh, there are. So I think with around the world, you know, globally, there are quite a few competitors um, in the US, in Europe, in India as well. Um, however, I believe that each of us have our own USP and mm-hmm. each one specializes in different things. Um, it's definitely a growing space. And I think there are a lot of companies moving um, well, trying to digitize a lot more and are accumulating a whole lot of data. So that means a lot more job creation um, for, for companies like mine um, across, across the world, actually. Right. And everyone right. uses technology in a very different way to, to streamline, to create the efficiency that's needed. Right. Got it. So would you say your, like, where would you say your strength and, um, you know, USP would be, is that in, within Malaysia, within Southeast Asia, does it touch Australia? You know, how do you stack up against the competitors? So our, our clients are, are based globally. A lot of them are Southeast Asian, mm-hmm. um, but we are starting to get a lot of clients from, from Europe and from the U S from Australia, of course. Um, our workforce primarily is in Southeast Asia. So we focus a lot on building the community in Malaysia, you know, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, um, looking at Thailand. Um, I think what we can offer over here would be that, that cultural um, understanding, the, the different languages, because everyone in Southeast Asia speaks, um, you know, three or four different languages. Right. You know, in Malaysia, you've got guys who speak Mandarin, you know, Cantonese, you've got um, Bahasa, you've got English. So it's a very um, diverse um, community in Southeast Asia. So I guess that's, that's where we sort of focus on in terms of our, our pool of labor. And we like to ensure that everyone sort of feels part of the community that we're building. Got it. Got it. I mean, I, I feel like, um, you know, that, that's another sort of, uh, you know, with the language thing, I think, I feel like if you're a marketplace or anything, any sort of e-commerce online, that's, those are basically additional toggles. I mean, I feel like every uh, website now needs to have a Mandarin option, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I think, you know, our clients generally are not limited to, to guys in e-commerce. You know, we've got every, a lot of companies now are also trying to build um, their own machine learning applications. And 
um, you know, we become a very good partner for for them, especially when they're trying to scale up. Right. Okay. Cool. Uh, so uh, you you know you you mentioned this just briefly uh, just just now about where you're seeing traction and where you're looking to expand. So what what are your current sort of uh, to say 2018 goals uh, for Superhands, and then what other sort of uh, longer term goals? Maybe if it's countries or regions that you're looking to expand to, or different offerings or different ways that you're trying to grow your business. Um, what are some things that you guys are working on that uh, that you can uh, t- tell our audience a little bit about? Yeah, definitely trying to scale up um, the the super agent workforce across Southeast Asia. Trying to get deeper um, and build a, a a larger variety, you know, of languages, cultures, nationalities, nationalities, skills, um, in you know, within this region itself. Um, also, to try to you know solidify our position in in Southeast Asia or you know Asia Pacific for that matter, because now we're starting to expand a lot more. Um, into different countries across this this region, from say India to to China, um, and also you know looking at say potentially the U.S. market um, for partnerships. So we've been you know trying to find partners across different regions to help us scale that that part of the business in terms of a client in terms of a client base. Right, got it. Okay, cool. Um, so, Mark, I want to ch- uh, switch gears a little bit here for the sort of last segment of the interview. Um, you know, you, you guys are a, uh, you know, sort of, you've gone through sort of the 500 startups uh, class, you know, which is how we were introduced. And, you know, I'm, we're uh, we're good friends with them here at the show. And, and oh, nice. I personally, you know, um, I, I know a number of the uh, of the partners there. Um, and, you know, they, they, they did highlight the fact that uh, you guys were uh, one of the f- very select few that had gone through the Alibaba eFounders program. So, um, you know, as part of uh, sort of this, uh, this series that we're doing and in conjunction with them, I just wanted to ask you about the program. You know, what, what, how was your, that experience there? Um, what were your thoughts? Uh, you know, what did you learn? Are there any good takeaways that maybe you could share with the audience? <laughs> Yeah, so it was, you know, I think the Alibaba program was was extremely interesting. Um, you know, going into it, we weren't sure what to expect. And it was a two-week um, immersion program. And it, each day, it was essentially classes that ran from early in the morning till late in the evening. Um, you know, we spoke to directors of different business units. Uh, we spoke to the managers, um, the operational guys. So it was a full immersion into the Alibaba culture, the Alibaba ecosystem. And uh, what we found, what I found the most interesting was essentially the culture, the value system that they, that, you know, that they focused on a lot. Um, and that, that was essentially, that took up two days of the two week program. Um, essentially just talking about culture, talking about values. And it made me realize and made me um, think about, you know, how I could improve the culture within our business itself. How do I make sure that's part of, um, I guess, a long, there's a long term future for you know and, and it's penned down and it's um, a lot more structured um, rather than something a bit loose um, and I think that's something that a lot of us founders you know take for granted in the early days because we're trying to build the business itself right. um, yeah and looking back you know I'm thinking hey maybe we should have um, focused a lot more on on cultures you know, on, on culture of the business the the value system that you know that we have so I think that's a key takeaway from you know the Alibaba program itself that's a that's a great point because I think that if you look at uh, kind of do case studies of the the, the most successful uh, startups, you know you you it's pretty binary. I mean, you, you hear about the ones that are are just awful places to work because the culture is just really bad, uh, and that usually come. I feel like it does come top down, uh, and and I also feel like uh, you know to your to your point. Uh, people are, are very focused on growth, especially when it's a startup and, and you're funding and you're taking investors' money and you just want to hit hit the metrics and this sort of thing. Um, and I think it is helpful to, to to actually be cognizant of, you know, what kind of culture do I want to uh, build here at this company? You know, and even as a as a founder or a leader, you know, how do you project that to to your uh, subordinates as well? Um, yeah. So that's pretty cool. What were there? What were were there any uh, specifics about Alibaba's culture that you appreciated that you might want to emulate within your own company? I mean, there's something interesting, which was because um, Alibaba.com, you know, is a B2B business or was launched as a as a B2B business. That's right. And as they continued to grow, they they launched a B2C a C2C business, which was um, called Taobao.com. Um, mm-hmm. And essentially, what they did was to to get people to think in an opposite way because the B2B and B2C, uh, C2C is extremely different business. 
they, they had this thing where they got people to stand upside down or do handstands um, <laughs> in the office space. And it sort of um, initially was to get the blood circulating within the body itself. Sure. But after a while, they realized, hey, this is something that we could use as part of um, the culture of um, Taobao, which is thinking you know, upside down or thinking from the, uh, taking a different oh. point of view of, of how you look at life. And that was, I found that really interesting. So, that, you know, it was a good application to, to a, an, an active um, activity, essentially. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, I, I, it sounds like a great program. So I'm, I'm glad you got a lot, a lot out of it. Um, well, Mark, uh, as we look to wrap up here, you know, just uh, two final questions for you. Um, and the second to last one that I always like to lead off with, especially when I'm interviewing entrepreneurs, uh, you know, that, that are sort of found some success in, in what they're doing is, um, you know, for those in the audience that are listening in that uh, maybe are still banking <laughs> and want to break yeah. out and, and try to do, try to you know maybe do the entrepreneur thing and follow in your footsteps uh, what's one piece of advice that you could give them Let's see, I think it would be adaptability I think that's very key in, in you know in this kind of in at this kind of, uh, of life at this time of life um, you know things are changing so quickly technology mm-hmm. new technology is coming through. And you just got to be adaptive to, you know, what's going on in the market space. You need to know what's going on in the West and how you can adapt that to um, the East. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a good, that's a good point. And, uh, and, and even just personal adaptability as well. You yeah, know exactly. I mean? Right. As an entrepreneur, you know, there's ups and downs, there's always going to be failures. So to be able to be nimble and agile and, and all that, I think it's uh, it's important as well. Exactly. Um, Great, awesome, man! It's been it's been great getting you on the on the show, and thanks so much for sharing um, about your company, Superhands. And we're we're definitely going to look, uh, we're going to keep an eye out for it, and and uh, and and follow your progress. What's the uh, final question? Is what's the best place that people can find you, follow you, or learn more about what you're working on there at Superhands? Yeah, just easily on uh, on Facebook, you know, Superhands.com or Instagram itself. Okay, and and you on LinkedIn or any of those networks? LinkedIn as well. Yep. We're all, yeah, so either Mark Co or you know, or Super Hands. Fantastic. We'll get that all linked up in the show notes. And uh, cool. thanks again, Mark. We appreciate it. And best of luck. Thanks, Jay. All right. Take care. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. All the show notes and links can be found over at jkimshow.com. Come back often and make sure you subscribe, rate, and review. Don't forget to join us next week for another exciting episode of The J. Kim Show. I'd love to hear your comments. You can find me on Twitter at J. Kimmer, J-A-Y-K-I-M-M-E-R. See you guys next week. This podcast is brought to you by Hack Your Fitness, the high achiever's guide to getting ripped in under three hours a week. If you're anything like me, you're probably working a full-time job or jobs and trying to find time to balance family life, social life, and last but not least, fitness. Look, I get it. I'm a full-time investor and entrepreneur myself and father of two. So how am I able to stay fit year-round without spending hours and hours in the gym killing myself on the cardio machine? After struggling for the last 15 years trying every workout and diet under the sun, I finally designed a system that allows me to achieve and maintain single-digit body fat for life in under 3 hours a week. Cardio not required. Head on over to hackyour.fitness and download my free 13-page guide that teaches you the simple science behind efficient fitness and smart nutrition and gives you everything you need to know to finally take control of your life. That's hackyour.fitness.